historic event. I don't believe there's ever been another time in the history of Canada that a political party at three levels of government has stood in Vancouver to take a position on a critical issue. So I'm joined today by my colleagues, the leader of the Green Party of British Columbia, James Sturck, um, deputy leader of the Green Party of Canada, and an elected member of Green Party member of Vancouver Council, Adrian Carr. My name is Elizabeth May, I'm the leader of the Green Party of Canada, and member of Parliament for Sandwich Gulf Islands. I propose to do the press conference in English, but I should get to it for the other people in French. If there are questions in French, it's not a problem for Adrian ni for me. But I think it's a match for the journalist francophone. Thank you. We are here today united, and not only united as the Green Party of Canada, Green Party of British Columbia, and the Greens on the Green Party member of Vancouver City Council but also with a mandate from Green Party members from across Canada who in a special emergency resolution at last month's National Convention in Sydney, British Columbia, urged that we collectively, together, as three levels of Green Parties in this province, oppose the expansion of the shipment of bitumen and diluent from Alberta into Vancouver. We know that the proposal that Kinder Morgan has put forward is meeting with strenuous local opposition in Burnaby and in Vancouver. But there are reasons for British Columbians, especially in my own riding of Saanich Gulf Islands, to express concern now. This proposal would, ex would dramatically increase the number of super tankers carrying vitamin diluent. It would ex expand the size of tankers leaving the port of Vancouver. And we would end up with as many as 300 to 360 super tankers a year trying to get out from through the Second Narrows Bridge, under the Railway Bridge, and under Lionsgate Bridge. These are areas with significant tidal influences. The precision of the movement of these super tankers would have to be 100% perfect every day of the year for us to avoid serious accident that could foul our waterways, our beaches, and our shorelines from the lower mainland to the Gulf Islands. It's a risk we're not prepared to take. On the other side of the ledger, what does it mean for the economy? Well, as things stand now, the decision of the National Energy Board to have the price paid at the end of the Kinder Morgan pipeline go to the highest bidder has meant the production of the Chevron refinery in Burnaby has actually been uh, undermined They've had to lay off workers and reduce their production at the refinery in Burnaby of Chevron simply because they can't compete with the offshore tankers that want to take this vitamin crude to other refineries for other workers. So we're asking for a full reckoning. Why should British Columbians take these risks so that British Columbia jobs are at stake in the fishery but also in refineries? British Columbia jobs are at stake in tourism as well as in refineries. This is not a proposal in our national interest, and it's certainly not a proposal in British Columbia's interest. I'm going to turn the podium over now to Adrian Carr. I mean, no, I got it wrong. See, I get excited. I'm going to turn the podium over now to Jane Sturt, leader of the British Columbia Green Party. We'll leave Adrian for the last, and she can finish with a flourish. The Green Party of British Columbia like the Green Party of Canada, passed this resolution as an emergency resolution at our AGM in May. It was a unanimous, uh, unanimous support for the resolution, and the Green Party of BC believes that this project is equally important to the Enbridge project, and that we have a great possibility that uh, this will be passed by stealth as opposed by uh, a process of informed discussion. The Green Party believes that we need to move to a new economy, not the old economy that fossil fuels represents. We believe that we need to be investing in a renewable energy economy and a low carbon economy, and one that will stay, stand us in good stead for years to come for not only this generation, but future generations. And that kind of an economy is a jobs creating an economy. Elizabeth has already talked about how this project is a jobs destroying economy. This is an old economy project. If we want to take seriously the issues related to climate change, 
The only way we can do so is by transforming our economy in a very rapid and radical way to a low carbon economy, one based in renewable energies, and one where local people have a say in the decisions that affect their local environment. So the Green Party is uh, in favor of us moving very rapidly, and it, we, I'm very proud to stand with these two women at all levels of the Green Party to say no to the expansion of the Enbridge Pipeline. Oh, sorry, Kinder Morgan Pipeline. <laughs> Thank you, thank you everyone for coming. Um, bonjour tout le monde. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, deliver some petitions to Elizabeth May. So I'm Adrian Carr, I'm Deputy Leader of the Green Party of Canada, elected Green Party Councillor for the City of Vancouver. Um, there's been a Green Party of Canada petition um, that uh, we've been collecting signatures on just this last Saturday, this petition, which stands very clearly against any pipeline project which would deliver crude oil to the coast of BC, leading to tanker traffic off the coast of BC. Um, this uh, petition says no to all of them, and yes to a crude oil tanker-free west coast of Canada. There are 239 signatures here in this envelope from the West End Festival this past Saturday, Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth stands in the House of Commons any time we collect at one of our events, the signatures, we ship them to her and she gets to stand up and talk about uh, those people um, who, who have signed this petition. But I want to just give you a feeling for what it's like to petition on this issue. I petition on lots of issues in my history in green politics in this province. And only the petition to save Clapwood Sound and uh, the petition for proportional representation, a, a new voting system, uh, a fair voting system in BC, have I seen the kind of public enthusiasm that I'm seeing when I go out on the table and collect signatures on this petition for a crude oil tanker free West Coast. People are lined up to sign the petition. Um, and, you know, it's that kind of, there are people of all ages of all backgrounds, of all ethnic backgrounds, age backgrounds, you know, styles, families. It's just, it's an amazing process to see uh, people see the sign saying, here's the petition, and they just come straight over to sign it. Um, I, I want to remind you, as media, that uh, it may well be um, a petition, the uh, HST petition uh, in BC, that uh, was the beginning of the end of a liberal government in this province. And it could well be a tanker-free BC petition that is the beginning of the end of the Conservative government in Canada. Um, I've been proactive on this issue uh, from the day that I was elected last November 19th to City Council. Um, why have I been so proactive on this issue? Number one, I was born in the city. I grew up playing on the beaches of Stanley Park. And I cannot bear the thought of those beaches being fouled um, by this tarry bitumen, which one scale would do. Um, number two, I am very proud that the city of Vancouver has as its goal to become the greenest city in the world. And it cannot become the greenest city in the world and be complicit in the primary cause of global warming, which is the increased use globally of fossil fuels. We cannot be the greenest city and the, the, the export port for both bitumen from the tar sands. Number three, I believe I have a responsibility as a councillor in the city of Vancouver to protect the health and well-being of the citizens of this city. And um, that means protecting both the environment they live in and the economy that flourishes here. And it's incredibly important uh, that we, um, we not allow as a city and take a stand against um, the uh, increased uh, transport of bitumen um, into the Lower Mainland and out through our port. The risks to the investment in Vancouver's economy, and the investments are in the billions, in the cruise ship industry, in the trade and convention center, in our tourism industry, the risks um, of, of one spill, and believe me, with 300 to 360 tankers a year, one spill will happen. There was a recent report to the, um, uh, to the uh, Northern Gateway um, hearings 
uh, that estimated that infected risk is extraordinarily high, a risk that no one would take if they were undertaking the building of a bridge, for example. Um, I have been proactive. I've been reaching out to other councillors. I have put forward several motions. I've supported the mayor's motion at the council table. But it's clear to me that as a councillor, um, I need to find the support at the provincial and the federal government levels because that's where the main decision is made in terms of the, uh, the decision to either go ahead with the pipeline um, expansion project that Kinder Morgan has yet to put forward but intends to put forward um, for, or for in increased tanker traffic. Um, so I am thrilled that the Green Party is, is at this point the first party to come forward at all three political levels, to stand in unison, um, to, to act proactively, federally, provincially, and locally against the Kinder Morgan uh, pipeline and, um, and expansion of tanker traffic. And, um, and I urge the other parties, the NDP and the Liberals, uh, to rethink their position and their waffling stand and uh, come forward in support of the people of this province, this city, who say no to Kinder Morgan and its threats to our economy and environment. Thanks a lot for coming. We're all open for questions. Oh, and can I just acknowledge, um, this, this Lewa too found, um, I'm sorry, your position is that? From the Sacred Trust. From the Sacred Trust? Yes. Okay. Um, and then West from the Wilderness Committee? No, I'm sorry. Gabriel George. Oh, it's Gabriel. You know what? You, I'm sorry, you're, the light is on your face and I don't have glasses on. <laughs> you do, you have that same look though. Anyway, thank you for, for coming as well. It's an honor to have you here. So, questions? And please, it would be helpful if you told us which one of us you'd like to take a stab at answering your question. Sanak Bouchard, Radio-Canada. Madame Mick, pouvez-vous nous dire, s'il vous plaît, Pourquoi est-ce qu'on considérait qu'il faut parler de ce projet-là d'une voie unie au côté au Parti vert aujourd'hui? En essayant de Parti vert, c'est très important pour nous d'expliquer la position contre les superfactoriels et pour expliquer à tous les autres citoyens du Canada qu'en Colombie-Britannique, nous avons eu un moratoire contre les superfactoriels depuis, oh, depuis plus de 40 ans. Et M. Harper imagine qu'il n'y a pas un moratoire seulement pour cause de son idée qu'il n'existe pas. Mais il y a un moratoire, nous avons eu un moratoire. C'est très important pour protéger les côtes, protéger les mers, protéger les emplois dans le tercherie pour le tourisme. Alors, pour moi, c'est un, un enjeu primordial. C'est important pour protéger le climat, mais en même temps, c'est très important de respecter les décisions qui sont respectées par les niveaux de gouvernement fédéral puis provincial euh, depuis euh, 89-72. Euh, il y a un moratoire, respect le moratoire. The first thing we need to recognize in Canada is that we waste more than half the energy we use. So uh, uh, the Green Party at the federal level recognizes that oil sand production will continue, but we believe it should be uh, held at a level, uh, basically current levels of production are quite high, 1.2 to 4 million barrels of oil a day, while we make a transition so that we reduce our dependency on fossil fuels for burning. We will have an ongoing need for petroleum products, particularly as a feedstock to the petrochemical industry, to plastics, manufacturing, so the product uh, of bitumen will become only more valuable over time. But burning it now as an energy source is a, is a horrific waste of our resource and also adds greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. So the solutions in order would be first, since we're wasting more than half the energy we use, stop wasting energy. That involves a huge employment project across Canada. 30% of the greenhouse gases in Canada that are wasted come from inefficient buildings. The heating, cooling, and lighting of residential, institutional, commercial buildings, huge wastes of energy. Canadians have no need to spend money heating and cooling the outdoors, but that's what we're doing. We also need to improve our, the efficiency of our transportation sector. 30% of the greenhouse gases in Canada likewise come from 
inefficient uh, gridlock in cities, lack of good planning, too many goods moving by truck as opposed to by rail. There are, there are a number of components. While we improve energy efficiency and reduce the demand, so we could do uh, the same level of economic activity we have today with half as much uh, energy used if we plug the leaks that are now in our system. Once we are you know, finished with a major program in energy conservation, that will allow us to have also ramped up the renewables. Wind, solar, tidal in BC, geothermal, low scale hydro. There are, and, and solar, both passive and photovoltaic active solar, are just the tip of the iceberg of what's possible in renewable energies. And around the world, you don't hear about it in Canada, because we've abandoned green energy under the Harper, uh, Mr. Harper's decision making. We've abandoned green energy. But around the world, what you hear is the breakthroughs, the breakthroughs that are anticipated that will convert renewables like wind and solar from a peak source of energy to base load power. And to make that transition from peak to base load, what we need is good, reliable storage of energy derived from solar and wind. And the countries around the world, the US, the Netherlands, uh, many countries around the world are making real breakthroughs in storage. Well, that's probably too much detail, sorry about that. <laughs> can, can I just say one related to that as well? Uh, we subsidize our fossil fuel industry, and uh, as long as we continue to do that, and as long as we support the expansion of the extraction of fossil fuels, we'll never create the level playing field that we, are, that we need in order to encourage the development of renewables in this province. British Columbia is in a perfect position to have geothermal energy, and yet we can't get geothermal projects passed in this province. First of all, because we, um, we are a hydro uh, province and, and we have a prejudice for hydro and against other forms of real renewable energy. And also because we subsidize the fossil fuel industry. And we have to stop that so that we can actually create new forms of energy after what Elizabeth has talked about, conservation first. Uh, BC Hydro themselves have, have found that we could have all of the new sources of energy we need to 2016 through conservation. So conservation first, and then we have to stop this crazy subsidization of the fossil fuel industry, and we have to create a level playing field so that we can get real renewables in production. And it takes a long time for a renewable plant to get up and running, and so we need to make sure that we have that time frame in our planning process. Are you expecting the Kinder Morgan project to play a big role in the next provincial campaign? I am expecting it to play a very big role. I'm expecting the Enbridge uh, pipeline to play a very big role, and I'm expecting the gas expansion of the fracking industry in north eastern British Columbia and the pipelines and the LNG plants in Kitimat to play a very big role in the campaign. Um, excuse me, with, with your indulgence, I would really like to have Ruben George, who is the Director of Community Development for the Tsleil-Waututh First Nations, come. It's an honor to have him uh, attend our press conference here. Thank you, Ruben. Oh, thank you. Um, OICM, OHPSCM, CIF. We're, we're just thankful that we're coming together as, as a nation of people to, to, to bring a stop to this, this fossil fuel addiction that we have. Our, our sacred lands are, 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 are too much to risk to, to allow something like this to happen. And, and also, too, um, before we got into this initiative, we as Tisleiwa, two people invested in, in green energy. We, we manufacture and, and sell wind turbines, so it's, it's something that, you know, we're walking our talk and we, we want to continue doing that and we want to stand and have people stand with us that have the same initiatives. This is a problem for all of us, for all British Columbians, for all Canadians, for all the people in Vancouver. It's, it's all of our problem and, and you know, when, when we're doing this work and when we're stepping forward, it's, it's for you. It's for you and me and our, our future generations. This is my brother Gabe and I um, just can share a little too. Thank you. Yes, uh, Gabriel George, part of the Sacred Trust with the Tsleil-Waututh Nation. And I want to also commend the Green Party today for their announcement. It's wonderful to hear. And our history of our people, it goes back thousands of years to this land. And my late grandfather, Chief Dan George, he talked about where people used to go hunting. 
where Robson Street is today. And when the tide was out, where our community is now in the North Shore, there's a tidal flat there. Our elders would say the table was set. And we've seen many, many, many environmental impacts come and affect our territories. And we want to step up now and say, no, enough is enough. We want to protect the environment. We've been dubbed protesters, but we're not. This is a birthright. This is the teachings, the Shnoiath, the lessons and laws of our people. And so, just in the spirit of the day, I, I, I raise my hands on behalf of our nation to the Green Party and commend them for what they're saying, because we believe as well that a healthy Burrard Inlet is, is the health of Vancouver and literally millions of people that live around it. Hi, Sapka. Thank you. Hi. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's an honor. It's an honor to shake the hand of the grandson of Chief Jack George. <laughs> uh, any other questions? And also for our friends who are here. Uh, we have a question before you leave. Oh, no, 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 okay. Any other questions? What do you say to the argument that the uh, pipeline is the safest way to carry any fossil fuel? Well, I think that the Enbridge performance in Kalamazoo, Michigan, is rather instructive. Uh, here you have the very same company that's promoting the project across northern British Columbia that was found by the U.S. National Transportation Safety Board to have been guilty of ignoring cracks that were in the pipeline that were found in maintenance before the spill, that when the spill began to happen, went around the control room shutting off the alarms, like somebody at home with toast stuck in the toaster and there's some smoke and the fire alarm goes off, you shut it off because you think, oh, it's not really a fire. They shut off alarm after alarm after alarm. And 17 hours after the beginning of the spill was when it was discovered how, not by anyone associated with Enbridge, but by an employee from the gas company who was sent out because the numbers of calls to 911 for local residents who felt sick from the unbelievable smell of the spill. That's how they discovered they had a spill. The first shift went home, the second shift came on. The first shift was busy shutting down all the alarms. Did they even bother to mention to the new incoming control room group, gee guys, we had some alarm bells, we shut them all off because we don't think it's anything. They didn't convey that information, so the second shift starts pumping crude into a leak. So 80% of what was spilled in the Kalamazoo River was spilled after Enbridge had abundant alarm ringing reasons to know they had a leak. They are incompetent. They are negligent. You are never going to have a pipeline system that can survive human error. And we will always have human error because of the humans that run the project. Yeah, if, if I can add to that, diluted bitumen is a different thing. It's not the same as conventional crude oil, sweet crude as they, they call it. Diluted bitumen is diluted by chemicals because as a natural substance, it's so tarry and thick, it will not flow uh, down the pipeline of its own accord. Um, so they dilute it with chemicals, and as Elizabeth pointed out, um, it's one reason why when there was a spill in the Kalamazoo, people felt so ill. Those chemicals in, in any spill or break um, are extremely toxic. Um, there were people who were undergoing seizures there were kids who were violently sick um, from, this, uh, from the chemicals that, that, that gassed off when that spill took place. Um, I want to know why in Canada we aren't having a discussion about um, putting a cap on the tar sands expansion because that's the only sane thing to do in terms of climate change. But then um, looking at the possibility of refining in Alberta, instead of shipping dilute bitumen, refining in Alberta, and, and shipping uh, the refined oil, especially east. In eastern Canada, we import, we end up importing oil so that in the end, 52% of Canada's oil needs are supplied in imports. We, well, what makes sense about us shipping a highly toxic substance that scientists say cannot be cleaned up at the end any break, any spill, this diluted bitumen will sink in fresh water and get into the bottom as they found in the Kalamazoo River, um, or it sinks in the ocean. You can't contain it with booms. It will wreck environmental ha um, havoc forever at that point. So um, it's, it, this is not a safe way to go. And, and uh, I don't know the number, but uh, if you look at some of the, um, the websites where they're, they're monitoring 
uh, the pipeline system in North America, there's hundreds of spills on pipelines. And part of that is what Elizabeth talks about. It is the failure of these companies to maintain the system with integrity. Some of them are small leaks, some of them are large leaks. But this is not a safe system if we don't have companies that are held to account for ensuring that the system's integrity is uh, always at top form. And then you have the human error of uh, people who just simply don't pay attention to the alarms. But we've had very high profile spills in the last year and I think that anyone who argues that pipelines are the safest means of transportation needs to really look at the evidence that shows that they're not. En français, peut-être avec un peu de. En français, je sais, c'est pour l'arrivée. Je voudrais savoir l'urgence d'agir maintenant. Pourquoi c'est urgent Oui, en français. Je pense que l'urgence, c'est parce que. If you have a, a um, I should answer in English, it'll be better if it's okay. You can answer in French. Okay. Um, the, the urgency really is, is because, number one, um, we are seeing, in terms of global warming, increased evidence that our actions have been paltry and we need to change course. Um, there's just recently been, uh, this week in fact, uh, new evidence that in terms of global warming, um, the release of, uh, of carbon dioxide from the melting of the permafrost is going to add about a half of a degree of increased warming. That's w without even the additional industrial use of fossil fuels. So we need to slow down. So the call by scientists is to slow down our use of the fossil fuels. Um, and so why be drilling more out of the ground um, and, and shipping it? overseas where it will burn. Whether we burn it in Canada or not is contributing to global warming. A second ur urgency um, is that we, uh, we are in a position where um, from a regulatory point of view and a decision-making point of view, um, the, uh, uh, the decision on the northern gateway is coming down the pipe within, literally, within um, a little, little more than a year. Um, and meanwhile, Kinder Morgan itself is indicating in the media that it is ramping up its public outreach and its, um, its provision of information, engagement of the, of the public. Um, so we need citizens to be aware of this and to be aware of the threats posed by Peter Morgan's proposals. And I would just add that at this moment, for the question of the menace of climate change, c'est une crise, on, et maintenant le temps presse. Ce n'est pas trop tard, mais il est presque, presque trop tard pour agir, pour protéger l'avenir pour nos enfants et nos petits-enfants. C'est l'enjeu le, le, le plus important pour tous les gouvernements du Canada, mais c'est un, un enjeu, une crise silencieuse, parce que les autres partis manquent le courage pour dire clairement que nous ne sommes pas dans une crise global, une crise au Canada qui menace l'avenir la, pour nos enfants. Le, le, je ne sais pas pour dire quelque chose plus que ça, mais ici, à la question de les pipelines de Kinder Morgan, c'est aussi très important et urgent d'avoir de, 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 une croissance de sensibilisation de population parce que les décisions sont très, très tôt et il n'y a pas le même niveau de, de uh, sensibilisation pour la mobilisation contre les projets et aussi pour montrer les solutions et les alternatives euh, ensemble, tout le monde, comme le niveau du gouvernement fédéral, provincial et aussi municipal. Pour, pour, pour moi-même, c'est tout une question d'urgence, d'urgence globale contre le change, la menace de changement climatique et aussi locale pour euh, faire des représentations, pour, euh, pour euh, montrer l'opposition des euh, nouveaux. Are there any other last questions? I yeah. see some. Sure. Yes. What, what do you? Or whatever. Who are yet behind the pipeline? 
Well, I'd say that. I mean, against the pipeline. We were against the pipeline, mm -hmm. but they still voted for different parties. So it's. I think that what, you know, it's difficult for me as, I've got to say that as a federal leader of a political party, I'm the least partisan person you're ever going to find. <laughs> so what I end up wanting to say to them is, work on your party. I don't, I mean, it would be easy in a cheap shot to say, well, they should have voted green. If you're a liberal or you're a conservative, you're in a very good position to go to the people you elected and say, I didn't vote for this. I'm, I'm a conservative, but I want to conserve the environment of BC. And these radicals in Stephen Harper's cabinet must be stopped. Just, just uh, in response to that, I think it's very encouraging that this is not a partisan issue. We have liberals, we have conservatives, we have socialists, we have NDPers, we have Greens who all stand in opposition to these pipeline projects, the Kinder Morgan expansion and the Enbridge pipeline. This is a British Columbia issue. Yeah. This is a local issue. This is a First Nations issue. This is our home. I, I love the fact that the First Nations talk about this as being a sacred place. And I think we all need to understand that our home is sacred and that we're not going to let these industrial projects trash what is sacred to the people of British Columbia. So it is not a partisan issue. We're hoping that the other parties will take a strong stance on Kinder Morgan. Uh, and we think that they should. And so it's very encouraging that liberals and conservatives can oppose this pipeline and still be liberals and conservatives. Okay, thanks very much for coming. Um, and I uh, really, really appreciate you being here. And we'll, we'll all be around if you have any individual questions for us.